like a little, like a, and it's also got that brr -dum. No, what am I doing? Get faster. What do we got? Weird percussion. I like it. Free and open source motherfucking software, bitch, on a ThinkPad, bitch. actually too good um, it's like I don't want to come in here uh, it's like it's it's a cognito hazard this is where there's so much like weird fucking discourse around anime is people that people like don't understand fiction and stuff is because it's like there's this there's this version it presents such a utopic version of the world like it's just too good of escapism and most people can't handle escapism that good um, and those that can normally have some fucked up reason for being able to or willing to like most people couldn't if you showed a random person let's say a uh, gotcha user just because that's been on my mind a lot um, if you just showed a random person gotcha user they'd most likely find it kind of boring and kind of cringy because the random person normally if you want to use that word doesn't really have any reason or life experience that would allow them to understand they're not alienated from reality enough to understand or have the correct experiences to understand the desire to escape to that extent, to a world that is so dissimilar from our own, uh, in such a like purely positive way. Um, and so the people that end up gravitating towards that sort of thing are the people who do have a legitimate reason to want to do that, to want to escape from this world in a purely positive way, like so vastly. So of course, they're mostly like autistic schizos and whatever. And of course the stuff that gets popular, you know, is literally escapism. It's about a guy who dies and goes to the anime world. I mean, of course isekai is the most popular genre. It's not, a, it's, you know, it's, it's not surprising at all. Um, and of course, like, the people who are really into anime, uh, the sort of elitists disparage this genre. They, they, they talk about how bad it is or whatever because, you know, to them, it's too on the nose. It's too uh, simplified. It doesn't go far enough. Either that, or they talk about how it's like bland and doesn't, you know, rep represent some sort of failing in artistic intent or lack thereof or originality or something along those lines. Uh, so, you know, it's no surprise that this idea of I want to escape into the 2D realm, uh, it's just something that is completely incompatible with life experience. I want to live in a world where I don't have to pay taxes and I just get to be surrounded by a harem of beautiful women for really doing nothing of value. Um, and that's that's the, this sort of unapologetic view that anime offers you it's this sort of unapologetically fanciful and utopic uh place space which anime allows you to inhabit and so of course those who don't really have any reason to desire something like that at least not to that extreme they'd be happy to escape into the world of westeros or harry potter or whatever is the the current thing uh, but, uh, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't have this context, they don't have this experience that a lot of them understand. So, you know, they don't really wish everyone was cute and, and nice. Uh, they've never had that sort of experience, so of course it sort of shocks them. And of course, once you've had that experience, you can't really go back. If you're the sort of person that would want such a thing, there's no, real, there's no turning back from that. Once you've dived in, even if you stop watching anime, as a lot of people do, you know, I have a lot of otaku friends. I'd say the vast majority of my friends are at least a little bit into anime, but most of them are very into anime, or at least were. They may post anime images on the internet every day of their lives. They may, you know, have anime profile pictures and talk about anime all the time, but a lot of them don't really watch that much anime anymore. All, all of this can be substituted in with manga and vid uh, visual novels and stuff like that, but a lot of them don't really watch that much anime anymore. Partially because they've just sort of watched all the ones that interest them, 
Um, but nonetheless, it sticks with you. I, I think this, this, like, it, you never, you know, there's some people who grow out of it who go through a phase when they're sort of in their in their teens. But there's a difference, right? There's a difference because those people that go through a phase generally go through the phase of like Death Note and Attack on Titan and, and uh, you know, whatever, Love is War, these sorts of the Reddit shows. They rarely go through the phase of like deep Moe shit. Uh, and I think there's a difference because once you've once you've seen that deep Moe shit, it infects your brain. It tells you that a better world is possible, and it doesn't judge you morally for wanting that better world, even when that better world is only better for you and doesn't really hold any like uh, logical cohesion, right? Like imagine the ha you know the typical anime joke is that there's a harem protagonist who is really just completely unremarkable and yet is inexplicably surrounded by a harem of beautiful women who want to fuck him and also doesn't really ha uh, you know he doesn't actually have sex with any of them. That's the weird um, you know limbo world in which the harem protagonist lives and it of course it doesn't make any sense when people point it out they think they're making some sort of grand point but that's the point it doesn't have to make sense it's complete escapist fantasy and they know that and they're saying it as if it's a bad thing but the problem is it's a brain worm once you've experienced it you can't unexperience it once you've understood the beauty of a world without morals you can't go back to a world where paying taxes is supposedly a good thing or you know whatever thing i'm, I'm talking about paying taxes because it's the most mundane thing i can think of but you can't go back to a world where you're sort of like a uh, a lonely guy without thinking about these sorts of things. I had a comment once on one of my videos that was um, something, someone said something about like, oh, this fucking middle class guy complaining about capitalism in a nice apartment filled with modern art. My apartment isn't that nice. It's basically three rooms, it's pretty small. But uh, I'm not gonna play defense for the apartment. Uh, <clears throat> however, I do wanna talk a bit about this art. So these two pieces, are just done by a family friend. They're not like by some like known artist or anything. In fact, none of the pieces in my place are done by a known artist. Uh, but like, yeah, these two pieces are just done by a family friend. They were given to my parents as a wedding present. Um, I don't really, I think this one was bought in some sort of like secondhand shop and I don't know where this one comes from, but it's maybe my favorite of the bunch. Uh, I think it's really cool. It's like a sculpture. It's like a, a, my mom used to call it white on white sculpture. I'm not entirely sure what the meaning of that is, but I always thought it looked super cool. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's like a really good piece. Uh, then there's this, which is just a picture of like, I mean, I, I also, I think this was taken by one of my dad's friends in university, uh, if I remember correctly. And then down the hall, that piece as well, uh, I, uh, there's two here. Uh, oh yeah, this one in my room, the famous one, also by the same family friend who did these two. Uh, but I don't know, I think this was like a gift from when I was born or something, because it's always been in my room, wherever I've lived. Uh, but these two, I don't know where they come from. Uh, they're not by the same family friend, and honestly, I don't appreciate them nearly enough, because I think they're actually pretty cool. I think this one's like a, a collage, it's not actually a painting, they're, they're like pieces of paper or something stuck to this uh, thing, and I, I think that's pretty cool. Um, and then this one... I, I don't know anything about it, uh, but I'm pretty sure they're not very expensive. <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, they're, they're mostly just kind of cheap. And then, you've never seen this one, because it's in the bathroom, and I don't normally record in the bathroom, but there is this like painting of a girl in the bathroom. Uh, this one I'm pretty sure came from like a uh, an antique shop or something. I think it was like a, I don't know the full story, but it was bought in a shop and it's not that expensive. That's what I can tell you about that. So ultimately, the point being, I really like most of this art, um, especially like these two pieces. These pieces, I'm kind of, I mean, they're, 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 they're very familiar to me just cause I've like, they've, I've always been in a house where they've existed, mostly that one. Like I can remember, being a kid in a completely different house in a different part of the world staring up at this exact painting and trying to think like imagining uh this is like a space like these like shapes as like hallways and stuff like that i can remember that uh but if i were to see either of these pieces in an art gallery today i probably wouldn't think much of them uh, however as I already said, this is like by far my favorite. I really like that one, the sculpture. I also like that one, and I like this one because this Bar Italia place is, uh, well, it holds a lot of sentimental value in my family, uh, but it's also just a really good place to go to a, for a cappuccino if you're ever in London. And um, yeah, that's, those are, those, that's the art. It's uh, maybe, maybe not as special as you might once have thought. Uh, um, I'm, uh, yeah, most of it was done by this family friend and given as gifts. In fact, I'm pretty sure almost all of it was gifts, but none of them were to me, like, they were all to my family. If you want to talk about expensive shit I own, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> a couple of my mum's old handbags are, like, Gucci and Louis Vuitton and stuff. I'm sure those are worth a lot more money than any of the art. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I, I'm probably gonna, I don't know what I'm gonna do with those. 
But but yeah, no, I'm not. I don't think I'm as rich as people think I am. <laughs> it probably gives like I have this posh voice. I'm like in such a weird scenario, like economically, because like I just had a bunch of. I'm not poor. I'm not. I, I, I mean, I'm not broke. I'm not broke. I've I've been broke, but I'm not broke. Um, and my family has had a wide variety of financial circumstances. But just due to coincidences, I've like ping pong between like middle class spaces and very much working class spaces. But as you can probably tell from my accent, the working class spaces came after the middle class spaces. So I kind of have this upper middle class accent, which is a little annoying, but I've come to terms with it. I used to try and like put on a more, uh, a like try and minimize it a bit, but uh, I, I no longer care because I'm not really in that many social situations. I don't really care if I'm judged anymore in those. I used to care a lot about fitting in at like schools and shit, but it's not like I'm in school anymore. I, I don't really see myself as belonging to any class. Actually, I'm sure that doesn't matter. Everyone's always complaining about something deeply wrong with the world. But honestly, it's not that bad. I'm doing, I'm pretty happy. The only thing I can complain about, delivery food prices are too damn high. They need to bring that shit down, okay? Eating out, eating at a restaurant and shit, that shit is too damn high. In Asia, East Asia, they eat out every fucking meal, every all the fucking time, and it's cheap as fuck. When I was in Japan, you get food that was about ten times as good and half the fucking price of any goddamn restaurants in the fucking London, mate. Right? It's bullshit. Okay? That's the only real problem. What's the difference? They have capitalism there in fucking Japan. Right? It's the same fucking food. If I go for ramen in Japan, it's the same fucking food. It's better. It's better food. What's the difference? What's the fucking difference? It's in Tokyo, right? It's not like they're not paying these people a living wage or they wouldn't be able to live and work in Tokyo. The people that work at these restaurants and shit, you know, like you can go to fucking Kaiten Sushi and get some sushi that is like the low end of sushi in Japan and it's like better than any sushi I've ever had over here and I've been to some fairly high class sushi restaurants. It's bullshit, and sushi is ex like sushi is considered to be expensive food in Japan. Even kaiten sushi is like the fancy version of going out to eat, and even that is like half the fucking price of like you know an equivalent social status meal over here. It's fucking bullshit. I'm sorry. They need to fix restaurants. But I don't know where they get. I don't know how they're saving all this money over there. But we need to be getting on this, right? I'm telling you. And if we could get delivery prices down as well, then I would never leave, need to leave my house, and I wouldn't be bleeding money. Because none of these places are even fucking good, man. You know. I fucking, but I, I go on fucking delivery fucking things online way too much, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm lazy and I ran out of groceries and I couldn't be bothered to go and buy more, so, you know, it happens. And they're all fucking dog shit, man, they're all not even good, they're not even fucking good. Like, they're fine, they're, they're, they're fine, but they're not even good, like, they're not even good for what I'm paying for it, you know? It's fucking insane. It's, it's fucking nonsense. I'm telling you, man. They, we need to fix our shit. There's something deeply wrong here. How is it possible that they're, like, overcharging this much when it's, it's not... Like, what's the difference? I don't understand. 
the only thing I can think of is like property prices, but even that doesn't make any sense because we're talking about Tokyo here, some of the highest property prices, like rents in the fucking world. It's fucking insane, man. What is going on? Who is taking all of this money? Like, where's all the money going? Is it just all getting funneled into the hands of the bosses? Is that what's happening? I kind of don't buy it. I don't know. What What is this? Is it because, like, like being a chef is some, somewhat considered a high-class career over here, where in, in the East it, it is sort of considered more like a tradesman type career, or at least historically, but that was also the case here until the goddamn fucking French ruined it for us. Fucking French ruining fucking everything. I don't know, that doesn't even really make sense. Like, I doubt that, you know, it's not like chefs are like this super high paid profession. Unless you're like a celebrity chef at like a high end restaurant. I'm talking about normal fucking places that make burgers and shit, you know? I'm telling you, it's fucking insane. What is going on here? I feel like Westerners just aren't aware of this. They just don't know that they're getting scammed because they've never been to Asia. This shit is so cheap over there. And it's not just the fucking, you know, the, the, the even the fucking, I'm not talking about the fancy shit here. I brought up sushi as an example of the fancy shit, like Kaiten sushi, but like, you know, a normal fucking ramen shop. You know how fucking cheap gyudon places are in Japan? You know how fucking cheap that shit is? There's nothing even comparable in the West to like such. There's not. I can't even. Ima I can't even think of something that I would even compare it to. Like you get these f fucking massive bowls of beef and rice for like dirt fucking cheap, and it's like super filling, super hearty. It's not like the healthiest thing in the world, but it's not that unhealthy, and it's tasty. It tastes as good as fuck, and, then, and it's so cheap, there is nothing in the West that compares to it. Like, fast food isn't actually cheap, this is like a scam, right? Like, fast food places normally have one or two cheap items on the menu, and the rest of it is actually pretty expensive. And those cheap items are generally, you know, not actually, they, they, they contain hidden fees. The hidden fees being, they're actually very small and not very filling, so you have to get fries with them. Or, and, and you normally are sort of baited into getting a drink and they always debate you, I don't know if you've noticed but they always have three sizes, like they have the small size which is too small for anyone to actually eat the medium size which is what you actually want to get but then the, the medium size will be like, I don't know 20p cheaper than the, the big size and so they're like you know, it's debating you, it's like, oh well it's only 20p to get this math, like, like to get like twice as much food, of course I'm gonna buy that, and then you get fat, it's insane, it's fucking insane, you know, obesity rates in Japan are fucking so much smaller than the West, I'm telling you, you look, I look at videos of Americans, and they're all fat, and it's not even Americans, like I go outside, everyone's fat, and I'm fat, it's insane, what is going on here, somehow we're getting scammed, getting worse food, and it's more expensive. And food in Japan isn't even healthy. I don't even know how they stay so fucking skinny over there. It's a mystery. No one knows. It's literally a scientific mystery. Because they eat like bowls of white rice with every fucking meal. Like they should be obese. But they're not. It, Japanese food isn't... Like the idea that Japanese food is like particularly healthy is nonsense. It, like, it doesn't make any fucking sense. It's insane. It's it's a fucking different place, I'm telling you, it's insane. And, and we're getting scammed for these shitty fucking restaurants, charging like ten times what the food is fucking worth. It's insane. That's what I have to complain about, like, not capitalism, just this. So Yui, on the comments of my last video, said, now, thank you for speaking for years about Digi Law, I already know, but I won't dedicate a single moment to my new friend Fun House, SMH. Uh, okay, I will run you through the Fun House Law then. Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I think more people should be into Fun House, and they're, 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 they were good when they were around. Uh, so, the Fun House Law is 
uh, at Machinima, there was a guy named Adam Kovic, and uh, he had a show called Inside Halo, which was dedicated to Halo News. This is in the super, super early days of Machinima. He's like a super early Machinima show uh, called Halo New- uh, called Inside Halo, where they go over Halo News. Uh, then, um, obviously, there's not that much Halo News to last you forever, so that eventually transformed into Inside Gaming. It was just a general show about general gaming news. Uh, Adam Kovic was then joined by Bruce Green and James Willems, uh, also co-presenting Inside Gaming, uh, uh, which then, uh, you know, they none of them were like journalists, really. Um, I don't know how they got this job, but uh, they, they eventually transitioned away from being like a gaming news show and towards being a variety Let's Play show. Um, I wonder if you can... So they, they did still do gaming news on Inside Gaming. It was just like a once a week they did a gaming news episode uh and then the rest of the time it was gameplay uh and i don't know i'm looking to see if there's like a way to find their old inside gaming videos uh, i mean there's some compilations that i'm aware of but i don't know if you can actually watch some of the full um videos but if you go on i mean if you just look up inside gaming there's a bunch of these compilations like best of inside gaming inside gaming playing steam roulette best of inside gaming all time like these all are all basically the same like fundamental thing um but steam roulette was one of their sort of iconic shows uh so what they would do is uh they they had this website called steam roulette or, or i guess it was a website and uh, what it would do is it would spin a wheel and pick a random game from steam and then they would have to play it and uh yeah, so there's this website, you spin the wheel, it brings up a random Steam game, and then Ultimate Doom, for example, and then they have to play Ultimate Doom. Now, this is, like, super early of their videos. This is actually before I started watching them, when they didn't even have a face cam yet. Uh, I, I wasn't watching them back back then, so I don't really have much nostalgia for these super early episodes, but uh, as you go on, they, they have face cams. They sort of go more to, like... This is, this is sort of the standard Inside Gaming Funhouse setup. So Adam would be playing the game, and Bruce and James in the background would basically be riffing improv comedy bits the entire time. Uh, and it's, it's a great dynamic, uh, and it just never gets old. It's just, it's just funny every single time. Uh, uh, Adam has a, a, a hilarious ability to like break every single game he plays, and he also is like very cynical as a person so he like you know it's just like he's being tortured forced to play these awful steam games or whatever meanwhile bruce and james in the background are just riffing off of it the whole time often talking about stuff that just is completely not related to the game at all uh you know they go on like long tangents about 80s movies and and stuff like that uh it's it's endlessly funny and this formula essentially carried through the entire time so uh uh inside gaming was these main crew but you will see uh oftentimes the main crew is also uh, this guy in the, the so you can see uh, Adam, James, and Bruce here. But then there's also this guy with the glasses. That is Lawrence, who I believe was a producer originally, and then sometimes showed up on camera, and then sort of slowly got integrated. Um, Lawrence's sort of personality gimmick uh, is that he's he's sort of like the nerdiest one, and also an alcoholic. Uh, I, I think his alcoholism is definitely like very much played up for the camera, but he does drink a lot, um, <laughs> which uh, you you can find out if you watch uh, what I think is their best videos. If you want to get into which was that if you're looking for an introduction to Funhouse slash Inside Gaming, which is their drunk gameplays, which I'll I'll show in a bit, like it's what I recommend. But uh, so Inside Gaming goes on for a while. It you know as time goes on, they they like develop the style where they're riffing. Like Adam's playing the game, James and Adam, uh, James and Bruce are riffing in the background. They play a bunch of shitty games. It's fucking hilarious. Eventually, like, editing, they, they start doing, like, question and answer things where, like, they, they read comments and respond to them and riff on them, which is funny. Also, Lawrence jo starts showing up on camera more often. This guy, this is uh, another staple member of the squad. This is Joel, Joel Rubin. Uh, um, uh, he's, his sort of gimmick is that he's the gayest-seeming straight man ever. He's, like, married with a wife. Uh, <laughs> but he's, like, a theatre kid, like, a musical theatre kid. Uh, he's, like, very Jewish, very gay but not actually gay, although he is actually Jewish. Uh, also very funny. Uh, and then the final person uh, from this era who doesn't really appear on camera very often, uh, and so it might be kind of hard to find them, is Spool. Sean Poole is his real name, but everyone calls him Spool, who seems like who, his his gimmick is that he... I swear, they're like I'm telling you, they're like characters from an anime or something. They're just real people, though. Uh, his gimmick is that he just seems like he's high all the time, but he doesn't actually smoke weed. He just is like that. Uh, and if you ever see clips of him, you, you, you'll you see why, ever, like, like he really does seem like he's high all the time, but he's not actually high, and it's very funny. Um, 
he was sort of, I think he's like an editor, like he was never really like a big on-camera personality, he's kind of shy, he didn't really want to be on camera, but he became like a fan favourite over the years. So that's sort of the main squad. Uh, uh, James, Adam and Bruce making up like the, the main three, and then the, the main side characters being Joel, Lawrence and Spool. Then Machinima goes bankrupt, uh, they get out, you know, they were like very, mis- everyone was very mistreated at Machinima, they got paid like shit and treated like shit and whatever. Um, uh, Machinima like tried to force them to do things that like everyone on the team knew would be a failure, uh, but whatever. And so they they get fired. For, you know they get they get fired for everyone gets fired with basically no notice. Uh, Machinima doesn't exist anymore. They're all out of a job. And then all of a sudden, Rooster Teeth is like, "Hey, we've got money. Uh, do you want to just continue doing our show, doing your your shit for us instead, and have more creative control?" Uh, and that is the birth of Funhouse, spelt like this fun house like a german might spell it fun house uh the fun house still going to this day with mainly i'm pretty sure uh james is the only one still there um so fun house stuff begins uh here you can see th- this is the welcome to fun house oh fucking ads i forgot about this i'm used to being i don't know what i'm used to being but this is the, the, they, they 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 become fun house uh and keep doing their stuff uh, there's James, there's Spool, there's Bruce, there's Adam. Okay, they do their shit, they have a podcast now, They do, which is called Dude Soup, which is pretty good. Uh, they play random shitty games mostly, Open House is their comment show, they have this like orange aesthetic, and they have the main sort of things they do is uh, Open House, the comment show, uh, um, Dude Soup, the podcast, uh, GTA 5, which a lot of their GTA 5 stuff is some of their best stuff because they mainly just do races, right? They just do GTA 5 races and it's just like Adam doing the race and then they're just talking about something completely irrelevant. Like they never talk about the game at all. A lot of their best clips that you might see come from just like, it's just a podcast with GTA footage in the, in the foreground. It's a 12 minute like cut, cut up to be funny comedy, like, improv shit with just GTA 5 gameplay, <laughs> because why not? Uh, then Demo Disc, which is also really funny, uh, where, where they had, they just play old Demo Discs, uh, which, which are generally bad. Uh, and then they play, they play a bunch of, like, bad games, you know? Generally speaking, play bad games. Uh, and then, uh, that's sort of their, their bread and butter, uh, uh, they often do like series where they'll play like a bad game from the beginning to the end, um, and like you get like running jokes. They're all fucking great. Like all of them are really funny. Uh, sometimes I mean there and then and then the wheelhouse is the return of Spirit Steam Roulette with a different name. Uh, it's the same thing, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's how Funhouse was for for like pretty much the entire time with just some like occasional extra things thrown in for spice you know it wasn't just those series over and over again there were some sort of special events sometimes uh, they would uh, for example play competitions against achievement hunter uh, none of which i really cared about except for one of them which is very funny they were supposed to have a uh, overwatch uh, comp an overwatch match right and so they they just hired Cloud9 Overwatch team to play for them and didn't tell Achievement Hunter. So it's just a video of Achievement Hunter getting completely fucked by professional Overwatch players, uh, which is, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a classic. Classic bit of prankery. Um, so, uh, that pretty much continues, and then in the meantime some new members join, uh, and some members leave. So, the first thing that happens that I can rem- if I can remember off the top of my head is James's wife, Elise, joins the squad. Now, you might think this is really bad, but it actually works out very well because they're all friends in real life. Uh, so they all have like a really great chemistry and like Elise sort of instantly fits in and adds a really good uh, dynamic. Uh, then uh, Spool leaves at some point. Spool leaves to go off and do his own thing in Austin, Texas, I believe. Uh, he, he leaves, which everyone's very sad about. If only they knew how bad things could get. Uh, you have the birth of this guy. This is Matt Peake. He was an editor, uh, known for being very quiet and reserved. Again, kind of like Spool, became like a fan favorite with the, the cult of Peake uh, began. Uh, people would uh, use a symbol of like a forward slash and a backslash to replace the A in Peake's name, uh, like, like a mountain peak. Uh, very funny. 
Um, and then uh, things sort of simmer down. Eventually, Joel leaves, but some more of the editors start becoming more regular features uh, as on-camera personalities. Um, they also, at some at certain points, do what I think is probably their best content, especially if you're trying to get into Funhouse for the first time, which is their drunk gameplays. Uh, I'm pretty sure if you just Google like Funhouse drunk, that like it's like one of the first search results. Funhouse drunk, like they're so fucking like pretty much all of them are, are like god tier. Oh, not maybe not these newer ones. The older ones are better. Um, if I I think uh, like some of these the GTA Five ones are really good. Um, the uh, the one two dr this is this is like one of the best YouTube videos ever made. It's it's fucking hilarious. Um, uh, yeah, and all of the talking stockings uh, things are really good too. So talking stockings, how do I even begin to fucking describe this? So all the drunk gameplays are recorded like well whatever it doesn't matter. But the the talking stockings thing came from like a a, a, a throwaway joke in one of their videos where they they bring talking about this old show from like the nineties called Silk Stalkings, which is apparently like a, a late night crime drama which when you turn it on late at night and you watch the intro, kinda looks like it might be porn, but then it's never actually quite porn, although it keeps baiting you. Like apparently this was a thing in the nineties. It's like kind of a raunchy late night crime drama that you think is gonna have like softcore porn in it, but then never really does. And they 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 as it's part of this throwaway joke, they were talking about starting a, a podcast called Talking Stalkings. And then they actually did it, and they made four episodes over the course of like three years, and they get like wha like more insane each time. I personally think episode three is the best one, also one of the best YouTube videos ever made, uh, featuring the recurring guest Raul Cooley, who is a uh, an actor, professional actor, who's actually he was in some big Netflix show, uh, I forget which one, but but a lot of people like him now. At the time, he was just in this show called iZombie, Zombie, which I'd never heard of on the CW, but then he was later in this big like fairly big Netflix show. Uh, he they also they have like some other, like, random people who show up to, to the office, but whatever. Um, so that's fucking hilarious. Uh, yeah, I generally, I generally recommend the Talking Stalkings episode three. I mean, if you really want to, you can go through from episode one, but you might not find the first two episodes that funny. Uh, episode three and four are the best ones, when they have, like, more of a, a production going on. A live ska band. <laughs> Um, and these, like GTA 5 Let's Plays, the Mario Maker Let's Plays, uh, they're, all, they're all good. They're all, all of them are good, really. Uh, maybe not so much some of the more recent ones, because they, uh, I mean, th this is pretty good, I think. This is pretty good, this is pretty good. And then they, they, these are like the more recent ones that I haven't seen. Uh, with these guys who are like editors, but at this point I was starting to stop caring, they were starting to get worse. They also, at some point, uh, they had a throwaway joke about like starting a hair metal band called Sex Swing, um, and they decided to make this into an animated show, and it's fucking awful. <laughs> this is like before they got bad, they were still funny. I guess they just don't really know how to write comedy that well. They produced like a full animated show about this like fictional band based on them, and it's just like the least funny thing ever. It's, it really sucks. Don't watch Sex Swing. It is not funny. Uh... Um, and, uh, yeah, eventually, uh, so people start leaving, uh, uh, Joel left, then Lawrence left, um, then Bruce left, which was, like, the biggest blow was, like, Bruce and Lawrence leaving, like, the biggest thing, and then, um, Adam had a bunch of controversy that he was, like, sending nudes to fans, I don't think they were underage, but he's supposed to, he's married, so that's kind of weird, <laughs> I think that was a big deal, uh, so he sort of left in disgrace, and there was also just some, like, stuff about him just not being a good person to work with, that, like, um, Raul Cooley uh, tweeted at one point, like, if you're wondering why I'll never go back to Funhouse again, blame that bastard Adam, or something like that. Uh, like, th uh, something about Adam is just, like, not good. Uh, so he ended up gone, so leaving basically just, uh, like, uh, James and Elise as the only original members left in the entire place, uh, which just ruins, like, it's not the same thing anymore, it's just a completely different dynamic. They're trying, I mean, they're trying to make funny shit, but they're failing. It's completely missing the the whole appeal is the, the the old, reliable dynamic of Bruce, Adam, and James, and that's gone now, so uh, it's no longer funny. Also, quite amusingly, um, because of like a weird series of mergers and buyouts and whatever, uh, the brand of Inside Gaming uh, fell into the hands of Rooster Teeth, uh, because I guess Rooster Teeth got, like, I guess it got bought by Warner Brothers, and then Rooster Teeth got bought by Warner Brothers, I think. Um, 
and so they started inside gaming again but just as a new like a pure news show gaming news show so that was kind of funny that at some point that happened uh, that was before <clears throat> that was before everyone left uh so um yeah i think that's about the full story of funhouse uh Obviously, they're still going, they're still making videos. As you can see, they, they have like 1.47 million subs. Uh, their videos used to get like millions of views. Uh, like, they have a lot of videos with over a million views, like uh, quite a lot. And this was like six years ago when getting gaming videos with over a million views was like a pretty big deal. And you can see how many videos they have with like over a milli. Like, they, they, they were doing like pretty damn well for themselves for, for a long time. Uh, but if you look now, like, they get like, look, like barely scratching 20k and 40k of view. Like, they are. 40k video like they are barely scraping by um just not doing that well at all uh, which i would say is a shame but also like i mean the content's just not that good you can't really expect views on kind of not very good content uh so that's funhouse that's the funhouse law uh if you want to get into funhouse watch their drunk gameplays watch talking stalkings episode three um and four and then if you really want to go back and watch episodes one and two and then uh, you, you go go on YouTube and just look up Best of Funhouse. Oh my god, I can't fucking type with one hand. Just look up Best of Funhouse, and there's like these, like, is it the same guy? Yeah, it's this guy, right? This, this like, Thomas, I'm pretty sure it's this guy that made all of them, did he? Uh, maybe? Yeah, like, all of these, the, like, the five volumes of Best of Funhouse, uh, and the best of inside gaming. They watch all of these videos, and then you'll basically be, you'll basically have watched all of the best um, stuff. And hey, while you're at it, watch Sugar Pine Seven as well. Sugar Pine Seven also good, and Cow Chop also also good. Uh, well, only watch the first season of Sugar Pine Seven though. It kind of goes to shit after that. Uh, there's even a crossover. That, there's like three different episodes of Funhouse that had. Like the Funhouse show off in a couple of episodes of Sugar Pine Seven, and Sugar Pine Seven guys show off in a couple of episodes of Funhouse. Uh, there you go, Funhouse lore. I forgot to mention one extra bit of Funhouse content that happened somewhat later on in the Funhouse era, which is the Google Trends show. They had a game show for a while that was also pretty funny. Uh, there you go. Bring a clip because the the stuff I said before wasn't. I, I didn't say it in the clearest terms, so I'm just going to re-record this. You would never have known if I didn't tell you, but it's the explanation as to why the camera is different. Uh, uh, one of the biggest reasons why I'm an anarchist, uh, nothing to do with ethics, exploitation, none of this shit, right? It's simply about, like, the, the efficacy of a system, how well a system works. And I think uh, there are lots of situations where decentralized systems are better uh, for various purposes than centralized hierarchical top-down systems. Uh, if we're gonna compare the two, I'm gonna try and be as honest and as possible. So one thing anarchists don't like to concede, but which I will concede, is um, this idea that hierarchies get shit done. Uh, tankies like to use this. A lot, of, uh, a, a lot of people who support any sort of top-down hierarchies, one of the biggest reasons they do so is because they talk about how they can get shit done. And I actually, Think that they're kind of right about this. Uh, I have a couple of caveats, but I think they're kind of right about this. I think um, uh, if you can imagine a hundred people in a room doing it like uh, with a task to perform, uh, you can imagine very simply that if there was one guy who would just tell them how to do it, they could get it done much faster than if they all had to, you know, talk amongst themselves and come to a consensus without any central authority to decide for them and to tell them what to do. I think it's pretty self-evident that the first option is going to be uh, faster and more efficient than the second option. Um, uh, the, the couple of caveats that I will give here uh, is that while this is true on a scale of maybe a hundred people, the larger you scale it up, the less tenable it becomes, whereas decentralized systems become better the, the, more, the, the, the more you scale them up. So, uh, uh, you know, once you get to, say, a million people trying to de uh, all decide what to do, you can't just have one guy that tells everyone what to do. That guy would have to do too much. You have to delegate. And this is the birth of bureaucracy and middle management, which is incredibly inefficient. And you never, you eventually end up at a phenomena like bullshit jobs. Um, once you scale this 
uh, premise up to the size of a full society, you end up with this whole middle management class uh, or classes, you know, different strata of uh, middle management who uh, to, to delegate, to delegate, to delegate, um, which is extremely inefficient. Uh, I would compare a decentralized system to a company with high initial startup costs, but also high returns. Those also scale well. Uh, so the thing about a decentralized system is it does take longer to reach an initial conclusion. But once you've reached that conclusion, people self-organize. And then in the long run, uh, you you save, uh, you know, it's like a, a company with a, a high initial startup cost, but low um, I, I think there's a there's an economics term for this, but it, it doesn't cost that much to keep it going. Uh, so if you're trying to do something uh, in a decentralized system or an anarchist system, you, you it will take longer to get started. But I personally think that once you've gotten started at large enough scale, the advantage of being able to self-organize and not having to rely on bureaucracy and middle management uh, will eventually prove... Uh, superior to the alternative. The other thing I would question about the premise that uh, hierarchies get shit done is I would like to know what sort of shit they're getting done and to, to whose benefit uh, is that shit. So, you know, I don't really want a system where people are very good at getting shit done, but that shit they're getting done is like killing each other or something. You know, that's it's not uh, desirable. Uh, <clears throat> Whereas, so it might be okay to trade off uh, the efficiency if the actual outcomes are better. Uh, it's kind of like the sunk cost fallacy. Like, it doesn't matter how fast you can drive to the store if the store is closed. Uh, it doesn't matter how well you can reach an end goal if the end goal isn't actually desirable. So that's something I would also like to uh, contend. that I, I believe that an anarchist system would end up with more desirable end goals that are in the interest of more... Uh, people uh, rather than just the few people in power. However, once again, I will concede some disadvantages of this sort of democratic system, uh, which is, uh, while I'm talking about it as if you, it scales well, it scales well in space. I do not think that these systems scale well in time at all. Uh, and this is like one of my biggest problems with anarchism and democracy uh, is that d democratic systems really don't scale well temporally. Uh, compare like a Western democracy to China. One of the reasons China has been such an economic success is because they are able to institute unpopular policies that will not bear fruit until 10, 20 years down the line. Whereas in the West, we can't do that. If a politician proposes a policy that's unpopular and, and won't bear fruit for, you know, 10, 20 years, that uh, they won't do it because they're too scared of losing uh, subsequent elections and stuff like that. Uh, the turnover rate is too high. You just can't propose long-term projects like that if they're not already extremely popular and sometimes you need to do that in governance. So I think that is definitely something that the more democratic system becomes, the, the uh, harder it is to propose policies like that and to actually implement them, which yeah, I do think is a problem. I think it's a, a reasonable trade-off, but uh, I, you know, maybe there's some other uh, solution in the, the form of organization which you could implement to maybe lessen the impact, soften the blows. Uh, another thing, that, and the second thing that uh, we can compare centralized versus decentralized or hierarchical versus flat uh, systems is uh, on terms of resilience, which I think is one of the, the major factors here, since we're talking about implementing a system to, uh, you know, ostensibly overthrow capitalism, it's going to need to be highly resilient. And in computer science, everyone knows that decentralized systems are much more resilient than centralized systems, simply because centralized systems have a centralized point of failure. Uh, in terms of organizing a society, this presents itself in the fact that if you want to take power in a centralized hierarchical society, uh, the structures of power already exist, you just have to take control of them. In an anarchist society, those you have to build those structures from scratch, which is a much bigger ask. Um, if we, uh, a lot of uh, uh, criticism levied to anarchism is that it will inevitably turn it out to uh, be ruled by sort of gangs and, and like organized mobs, uh, and it will sort of not really stay as anarchism for very long. Uh, 
You can see that happens in capitalism right now, and we can analyze why and how that happens. I'm not actually aware of this ever happening in an anarchist-like society, but uh, we can look at how those sorts of gangs, uh, like criminal gangs, operate right now. Now, the, you may be tempted to imagine that they, they have power uh, through like coercion and violence, uh, but I think that a more reasonable analysis is that they use coercion and violence to maintain power, not to actually take power. That's not actually this, the root of their power. The root of their power is normally selling drugs uh, and other forms of economic exploitation. Uh, such a, I'm not saying selling drugs is economic exploitation, although it can be, but uh, I'm saying they, they sell drugs as their like main source of income, and they also participate in things like... Uh, you know, dodgy uh, landlordery and uh, uh, debt sharking, uh, uh, these sorts of things. Uh, so what they're doing is they're taking advantage of already existing systems of power. If you can imagine in an anarchist society, it's much harder to make a lot of money selling drugs when there's no prohibition against drugs and also no money. And so it's kind of hard to get the power in the first place that an organized uh, gang needs to maintain itself. Uh, you can't do it just through violence because that, that will never work. You need power in the first place in order to have the means to violence, which they won't have if there's no no already existing structures where they can seize power through wealth accumulation. Uh, so uh, this also uh, has the same effect against attacks from, the, from without. Um, you know, you can see this in terms of military strategy, where, like, you know, the strongest militaries in the world don't seem to be able to take out uh, decentralized distributed terrorist cells um, because, you know, it, there, there's no central organization to target. Uh, there's no single points of failure. These networks are very resilient. Uh, it's also the case in computer science as well. Imagine if you're torrenting a file compared to downloading a file directly from a server. Uh, if that server goes down, your file is gone forever, you can't download it. Whereas if you're torrenting and one particular cedar goes offline, it doesn't have much of an impact at scale. And again, I, I think scalability is, you know, it comes back here. So that's, I think, a, maybe hopefully I phrased that better than I did last time.